Part 2, Chapter 2, The Ports of the Archipelago Spread out on a large table, the enormous map of our motherland, indicate with the fat black dots all the provincial capitals, all railroad junctions, all transfer points where the railroad line ends and a river route, and where the rivers bend and trails begin. What is this? Has the entire map been speckled by infectious flies? What it is, in fact, is precisely the majestic map of the ports of the archipelago. It is a rare Zek who has not known from three to four or five transit prisons and camps. Many remember a dozen or so, and the sons of Gulag can count up to fifty of them without the slightest difficulty. However, in memory, they all get mixed up and together because they are all so similar. In the illiteracy of their convoys, in their inept roll calls based on case files, the long waiting under the beating sun or autumn drizzle, the still longer body searches that involve undressing completely, their haircuts with unsanitary clippers, their cold, slippery baths, their foul-smelling toilets, their damp and moldy corridors, their perpetually crowded, nearly always dark, wet cells, the warmth of human flesh flanking you on the floor or on the board bunks, the bumpy ridges of bunk beds knocked together from boards, the wet, almost liquid bread, the gruel cooked from what seems to be silage. And whoever has a good sharp memory and can recollect precisely what distinguishes one from another has no need to travel about the country because he knows its geography full well on the basis of transit prisons. Novosibirsk, I know it. I was there. Very strong barracks there, made from thick beams. Irkutsk, that was where the windows had been bricked over in several stages. You could see how they had been in Tsarist times. And each course had been laid separately, and only small slits had been left between them. Vologda, yes, an ancient building with towers. The toilets right on top of one another, the wooden partitions rotten, and the ones above leaking down into the ones underneath. Usman, of course, a lice-ridden stinking hole of a jail, an ancient vaulted structure, and they used to pack it so full that whenever they took prisoners out for a transport, you couldn't imagine where they'd put them all, a line strung out halfway through the city. You had better not tell such a connoisseur that you know some city without a transit prison. He will prove to you conclusively that there are no such cities, and he will be right. You must realize, dear sir, that every town has to have its own transit prison. After all, the courts operate everywhere. And how are prisoners to be delivered by camp? By air? The transit prison at Cotlas was tenser and more above board than many. Tenser because it opened the way to the whole northeast of European Russia. And more above board because it was already deep in the archipelago, and there was no need to pretend to anybody. It was simply a piece of land divided into cages by fencing, and the cages were all kept locked. Although it had been thickly settled by peasants when they were exiled in 1930. One must realize that they had no roofs over their heads, but nobody is left to tell about it. Even in 1938, there simply wasn't room for everyone in the frail, one-story wooden barracks made of discarded end pieces of lumber and covered with tarpaulin. Under the wet autumn snow and in freezing temperatures, people simply lived there on the ground, beneath the heavens. True, they weren't allowed to grow numb from inactivity. They were being counted endlessly. They were invigorated by checkups. Twenty thousand people were there at a time. Or by sudden night searches. Later on, tents were pitched in these cages, and log houses two stories high were built on some of them. But to reduce the construction costs sensibly, no floor was laid between the stories. Six-story bunks with stepladders were simply built into the sides, up and down which prisoners on their last legs, on the verge of dying, had to clamor like sailors. In the winter of 1944 to 1945, when everyone had a roof over his head, there was room for only 7,500 prisoners, and 50 of them died every day and the stretchers on which they were carried to the morgue were never idle. The Nyazipogast transit point, latitude 63 degrees north, consisted of shacks built on a swamp, 
Their pole frames were covered with torn tarpaulin tenting that didn't quite reach the ground. The double bunks inside them were also made of poles, from which, incidentally, the branches had been only partially removed, and the aisle was floored with poles also. During the day, the wet mud squelched through the flooring, and at night it froze. In various parts of the area, the walkways were laid on frail and shaky poles, and here and there, people whom weakness had made clumsy fell into the water and ooze. In 1938, they fed the prisoners in the Kniaz Pogast the same thing every day, a mash made of grushed grits and fish bones. This was convenient because there were no bowls, spoons, or forks at the transit prison, and the prisoners had none of their own either. They were herded to the boiler by the dozens, and the mash was ladled into their caps or the flaps of their jackets. The imagination of writers is poverty-stricken in regard to the native life and customs of the archipelago. When they want to write about the most reprehensible and disgraceful aspect of prison, they always accuse the latrine bucket. In literature, the latrine bucket has become the symbol of prison, a symbol of humiliation, of stink. Oh, how frivolous can you be? Now, was the latrine bucket really an evil for the prisoner? On the contrary, it was the most merciful device of the prison administration. The actual horror began the moment there was no latrine bucket in the cell. In 1937, there were no latrine buckets in certain Siberian prisons. Or there weren't enough. Not enough of them had been made ahead of time. The Siberian industry hadn't caught up with the full scope of arrests. There were no latrine barrels in the warehouses for the newly created cells. There were old latrine buckets in the cells, but they were antiquated and small, and the only reasonable thing to do at that point was to remove them, since they amounted to nothing at all for the new reinforcements of prisoners. So, if long ago the Minisinsk prison had been built for 500 people, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin was never inside it, he moved about freely, and there were now 10,000 in it, it meant that each latrine bucket ought to have become 20 times bigger. But it had not. Our Russian pens write only in large letters. We have lived through so very much, and almost none of it has been described and called by its right name. But for Western authors, peering through a microscope at the living cells of everyday life, shaking a test tube in the beam of a strong light, this is, after all, a whole epic, another ten volumes of remembrance of things past, to describe the perturbation of a human soul placed in a cell filled to twenty times its capacity and with no latrine bucket, where prisoners are taken out to the toilet only once a day. Of course, much of the texture of this life is bound to be quite unknown to Western writers. They wouldn't realize that in this situation, one solution was to urinate in your canvas hood, nor would they at all understand one prisoner's advice to another to urinate in his boot. And yet that advice was the fruit of wisdom derived from vast experience, and it didn't involve spoiling the boot, and it didn't reduce the boot to the status of a pail. It meant that the boot had to be taken off, turned upside down, the boot tops turned inside out and up, and thus a cylindrical vessel was formed that constituted the much-needed container. But, at the same time, with what psychological twists and turns Western writers could enrich their literature, without in the least risking any banal repetition of the famous masters, if they only knew about the scheme of things in that same Minisinsk prison, there was only one food bowl for every four prisoners and one mug of drinking water per day was issued to each. There were enough mugs to go around, and it could happen that one of the four contrived to use the bowl allotted to him and three others to relieve his internal pressure, and then refused to hand over his daily water ration to wash it out before lunch. What a conflict! What a clash of four personalities! What nuances! And I'm not joking. That is when the rock bottom of a human being is revealed. It is only that Russian pens are too busy to write about it, and Russian eyes don't have time to read about it. I am not joking, because only doctors can tell us how months in such a cell will even ruin a human being's health for his entire life, even if he wasn't shot under Yezov and was rehabilitated under Krushnev. No one would have believed the story of Eric Arvid Anderson had it not been for his unshorn locks, 
a miracle unique in all of Gulag, and that foreign bearing of his, and his fluent English, German, and Swedish speech. According to him, he was the son of a rich Swede, not merely a millionaire, but a billionaire. Well, let's assume he embellished a little. On his mother's side, he was a nephew of the British General Robertson, who commanded the British zone and occupied Germany. A Swedish subject, he had served as a volunteer in the British army and had actually landed in Normandy, and after the war he had become a Swedish career officer. However, the investigation of social systems remained one of his principal interests. His thirst for socialism was stronger than his attachment to his father's capital. He looked upon Soviet socialism with feelings of profound sympathy, and he even had the chance to become convinced of its flourishing state with his own eyes when he had come to Moscow as a member of the Swedish military delegation. They had been given banquets and taken to country homes where they had encountered no obstacles at all, establishing contact with ordinary Soviet citizens. With pretty actresses who, for some reason, never had to rush off to work, and who willingly spent time with them, even tete-a-tete, -tete, and thus convinced once and for all of the triumph of our social system, Eric, on his return to the West, wrote articles in the press defending and praising Soviet socialism, and this proved to be his undoing. In those very years, in 1947 and 1948, they were roping in from all sorts of nooks and crannies, progressive young Westerners prepared to renounce the West publicly, and it appeared that if they could only have collected another dozen or so, the West would shudder and collapse. Eric's newspaper articles caused him to be regarded as suitable for this category. At the time, he was serving in West Berlin, and he had left his wife in Sweden, and out of pardonal male weakness he used to visit an unmarried German girl in East Berlin and it was there that he was bound and gagged one night. And is this not the significance of the proverb which says, he went to see his cousin and he ended up in prison? This had probably been going on for a long time, and he wasn't the first. They took him to Moscow, where Gromyko, who had once dined at his father's home in Stockholm and who knew the son also, not only returned the hospitality, but proposed to the young man that he renounce publicly both capitalism and his own father. And in return, he was promised full and complete capitalist maintenance to the end of his days here in our country. But to Gromyko's surprise, although Eric would have not suffered any material loss, he became indignant and uttered some very insulting words. Since they didn't believe in his strength of mind, they locked him up in a dasha outside Moscow, fed him like a prince in a fairy tale. Sometimes they used awful methods of repression on him. They refused to accept his orders for the following day's menu, and instead of the spring chicken he ordered, they simply brought him a steak, just like that. Surrounded him with the works of Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin, and waited a year for him to be re-educated. To their surprise, it didn't happen. And at that point, they quartered him with a former lieutenant general who had already served two years in Norlisk. They probably calculated that by relating the horrors of camp, the lieutenant general would persuade Eric to surrender. But either he carried out that assignment badly, or else he didn't want to carry it out. After ten months of their being imprisoned together, the only thing he had taught Eric was broken Russian, and he had bolstered Eric's growing repugnance for the blue caps. In the summer of 1950, they once more summoned Eric to Vyshinsky, and he once more refused. In doing so, he made existence contingent on consciousness, thereby violating all the Marxist-Leninist rules. And then Abomakamov himself read Eric the decree, twenty years in prison. What for? They themselves already regretted having gotten mixed up with this ignoramus, but at the same time they couldn't release him and let him go back to the West and so they transported him in a separate compartment, and it was there that he had heard the story of the Moscow girl through the partition and seen through the train window in the dawn light the rotting straw-thatched roofs of the age-old Russia of Ryazan. Those two years had very strongly confirmed him in his loyalty to the West. He believed blindly in the West. He did not want to recognize its weaknesses. He considered Western armies unbeatable and Western political leaders faultless. He refused to believe us when we told him that during the period of his imprisonment, 
Stalin had begun a blockade of Berlin and had gotten away with it perfectly well. Eric's milky neck and creamy cheeks blushed with indignation whenever we ridiculed Churchill and Roosevelt. And he was also certain that the West would not countenance his, Eric's, imprisonment. That, on the basis of information from the Kubishev Transit Prison, the Western Intelligence Services would immediately learn that Eric had not drowned in the Spree River but had been imprisoned in the Soviet Union, and either he would be ransomed or someone would be exchanged for him. This faith of his and the individual importance of his own fate among other prisoners' fates was reminiscent of our own well-intentioned Orthodox Soviet Communists. Notwithstanding our heated arguments, he invited my friend and me to Stockholm whenever we could come. Everyone knows us there, he said with a tired smile. My father virtually maintains the Swedish king's whole court. For the time being, however, the son of the billionaire had nothing to dry himself with, and I presented him with an extra tattered towel as a gift, and soon they took him away on a prisoner transport. Human nature, if it changes at all, changes not much faster than the geological face of the earth, and the very same sensations of curiosity, relish, and sizing up which slave traders felt at the slave girl markets twenty-five centuries ago, of course, possessed the gulag bigwigs in the Usman prison in 1947, when they, a couple of dozen men in NVD uniform, sat at several desks covered with sheets. This was for their self-importance, since it would have seemed awkward otherwise and all the women prisoners were made to undress in the box next door and to walk in front of them, barefoot and bare-skinned, turn around, stop, and answer questions. Drop your hands, they ordered those who had adopted the defensive pose of classic sculpture. After all, these officers were very seriously selecting bedmates for themselves and their colleagues. And so it was that for the new prisoner, various manifestations foreshadowed the camp battle of the morrow and cast their pile over the innocent spiritual joys of the transit prison. End of Part 2, Chapter 2